Hello and welcome to the Tavern Chat Cast. It's a podcast, it's a big cast, it's a cast cast. So we have a few voicemails. I'm going to go over the voicemails and I got some updates and some other stuff. So but let's let's get to the voicemails. Um, Randy from Biggest Geek has called the show, left a few messages. Uh about where I was talking about the most influential edition of D and D. Hey guys, uh, I want to comment on your Dungeons and Discourse uh, uh, episode. If Anchor, Randy, I just gotta observe. I- I'm guessing it was raining hard. It 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 almost sounds like you were washing your hands. I know you are. I just had to make that observation because I know somebody's gonna make it. Uh, but to go back, sorry, I know I'm distracted. Or we'll actually take, I'm having issues getting anchored to do the iPhone 8. Uh, this is Randy from Biggest Geekus, but anyway, um, there's some good qualities of all the editions. I mean, definitely third edition has a lot. I mean, here's one thing I never heard anybody say. It brought minis to the table. Now, I'm not, I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. And, uh, to be honest, most of my gaming career had minis on the table, but that's the caveat. Uh, they weren't used really to show um, where you were in relation to something else. It was used for marching order and to, to show off somebody's painting ability. And in my group, none of us had much in the way of painting ability. So, uh, again, it was just used for marching order. And a lot of times you were just doing substitutions. Minis were not really part of the game, let's be honest. You used them to say relative position, but nobody was moving them and counting squares and trying to exactly. make the game truly tabletop. So you have to give third edition that, in addition to OGL and other things that have been said. I don't know if miniatures make a game tabletop or not. I mean, do you need miniatures to make a tabletop game? You've, you've got your character sheet on the table, your own dice on the table. I think that you don't need the minis. You got your map, that's your game board, to a large extent. Even if most of it's happening inside your head, uh, again, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Could you play D&D on the floor? Of course. Just like you play Park Cheesy on the floor on the game board. So, again, I'm not sure if, that, if, if the minis were a great thing that 3rd Edition kind of forced on you. And I think they... I think 3E was certainly minier to centric, but 3.5 really stressed the need for minis. Now, my question, and this is, I'm going to throw this out there, and it's not just to you, Randy, but to any of the listeners. Do you think that the move to make miniatures more of a part of D&D as we know it was for gaming reasons or do you think it was more for commercial reasons it's like well you know we can sell minis or license minis at top that's just another income source i'm just wondering you know it, you know people we look at how much money games workshop has made over the years selling minis and the wizards of the coast see that as another another income source i'm curious I, i'd like to hear some feedback on that one Fourth edition is a little bit harder, but I will say this much. It did bring make the game very simple for new players. Fourth edition was simple. You had certain powers. I didn't like it, but it, it was simple. Uh, fourth edition, and now, never played it, but I own the uh, core books, and more than the core books. And I, when they reissued it in those trade paperback sizes, I had those too. What I didn't like about 4E from having read the rules but not played it is that there didn't seem to be much of a difference between the classes. Everybody got plus one to levels. What was the difference? What made you a fighter as opposed to uh, a cleric in combat? I mean, yes, I guess the, the, the powers and abilities, but f- from my experience coming from earlier editions, those combat adjustments to your actual role Defined your class as much as anything else, but and to start with, so 
very samey character, so we skipped over it too. But uh, good episode, too. That's good work. So Randy makes some good points, but Randy called back with more. So let's listen. Hey, Randy, again. Uh, yeah, I do realize that original D&D came from Chainmail and they use a war game, but when you look at the rules, uh, they're kind of no, they're hard to parse. It's extremely hard to parse, and yes, they came from Chainmail, but they also kind of assumed that you would use Chainmail with them. And od and was more miniature-centric than, than money. Because it, again, had that assumption that you're coming from miniature wargaming. It wasn't really until, I guess, uh, the basic set, the first basic set, that that view was kind of adjusted. And I don't really see any way to use the movement they used. I mean, did anybody use it on a tactical battle map? Maybe you... God only knows. Uh, again... I'm going to call it kit bashing, right? At, back in the early days, you used stuff from your different games, uh, war games and board games, and you used that in your game, right? It wasn't like Wilderness Survival the default outdoor map for od and D? I I mean, you literally were, were kit bashing. You were just grabbing stuff from other games to fill in what were perceived... I don't know, holes in your game. So what were they using for movement? Who knows? You know, I, I don't know if they call it house ruling back then, but uh, I believe that a lot of the stuff was house ruled. Did, I don't know. It just didn't seem to be an integral part of the game. So I still maintain third edition made the miniature part truly playable in um, D&D, if that's what you liked. Uh, truly playable? I mean, you could play. We did... Uh, we played it with when we were doing the uh, the battle system rules. Oh my God, that was a nightmare. But battle system got us thinking about using D and D miniatures in in, in second edition, um, more integral. And to we, we had one of those vinyl battle mats, and some encounters we would draw out the spot, and then we mini uh, put the minis out and. Never had enough minis for the uh, the creatures they were fighting, so that was always like dice or token stolen from another game. Maybe Risk. I had the one with the 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 Caltrop set, the plastic Caltrop set is what I had for Risk. So again, we kit bashed, but uh, just theater of the mind just seemed to be a preferred way of play for the groups that I was in. Again, I, I'm I'm going to talk about my own experience. And we did for a while. Um, I will say with Eric's defense of third edition, he really convinced me early on, but in a recent Biggest Geekest podcast, I think I've been more convinced that original D&D was bigger, more influential because it created the hobby. And yes, uh, od and created the hobby. Um, and without the hobby, none of this would be what we know it as now, and you probably wouldn't have computer RPGs and we would never have had Ultima and Wizardry and all these other classics from, I guess, the uh, the late 70s and early 80s, right? So, yeah, no, that's certainly, and again, that set, that opened up the doorway. What, what made, and, and Randy will follow up on this, uh, what made gaming what it is for today of all the editions after Zero E, after the white box, it's third edition. Okay. Um, it really, it gave us the OSR. No, of course, just the OSR is based on 1E, 2E, basic, BX, Beck Me, OD and D. Without them, you don't, you don't have the OSR, but without third edition with the open game license, you don't really have the OSR. You don't have the creativity that people involved in the process. Literally created the hobby, chain, created a brand new game. So I'm going to give that a slight edge over third. But after that, third is a very close second in the most influential uh, version of D&D. Okay, this is Randy for the third time. You uh, qualified with, uh, except for OE, 
original edition D&D wide box. So I think we're uh, simpatico on the most influential. I really enjoy Randy's uh, phone calls when he calls in. He makes valid points. He digs deeper into what I say or what Glenn says or whoever's responding to. And I think that's important. I think it's it's a big part of what what I do, what we do when, we, when I'm working with my co-hosts because it's a community. And your feedback, um, your comments are what makes this makes this work as well as it does. Uh, if you're going to call the show, you can call via Anchor, using the Anchor app, at, uh, via the Tavern Chat podcast, or 347-509-5168. Yes, after years, I've finally memorized this number. This was back in my college days when nobody had cell phones or even beepers, probably. Um, I memorized all my phone numbers, right? Now you just have it all on your phone. You look up somebody's name. You haven't seen the number anymore. So it took me that long, but I remembered it. 347-509-5168. need to leave a voicemail. Please call the show. Always look forward to hearing from, from people that are listeners, viewers. Now we have one about... Uh, Albert Rodeo, and uh, from Tim. So let's listen to Tim. Oh, I gotta, gotta rewind it. Damn it! Hey, Eric, Tim Stone uh, here with uh, some insight into Albert Radio. Uh, you and Glenn were just talking about it uh, on the Friday Dungeons, Dragons, and Discourse. And something was mentioned about, hey, they want to purge your account up to 24 hours and et cetera. You guys were speculating. I didn't get much further than that, unfortunately, but I wanted to call in immediately and, and just immediately give us some insight into uh, something you had said. Oh, maybe they don't, I think, and I quote, maybe they don't have the server capacity for the uh, volume and in quote, for the volume or for the traffic they're having. What I want to state, what I want to say is, is that more than likely, uh, they, it's not a server capacity problem. It's a, it's a volume or certainly, uh, once you exceed a certain amount of server capacity with a serverless or a, a cloud provider like Amazon, AWS, Amazon Web Services or something like that, you are going to begin incurring costs. And you know what? We're I, I am I am not a computer guy. Okay. My days of assembling computers from parts, building my own, uh, installing Windows from the initial install disks, floppies even. Oh my God. God bless me. Um, that's long, long dead. Troubleshooting. I, I gave I gave up on that. So the the intricacies of web services, you know, it, it's it's a layman saying, well, you know, their their, their capacity, server capacity. To me, it's a, you know, it's it's a limitation of what they can offer based upon their budget. Okay, and I think we agree on that. So they are supported by uh, Patreon, which is great, but I'm sure they're not in it for the money. They're in it for the love of the game, and I really appreciate that. Maybe um, they could offer Patreon backers, uh, hey, if you're a backer on Patreon, we can extend your, uh, I don't know, the length of time that we, we will keep the snapshot of what you've entered. Or Maybe give an ability that you can download it to your because most of being held on your end of, on, and anyway, it's on being held on your computer, most of the information or tablet or whatever. Give you the ability to download that as a file and then re upload that file so you can kick off where you were before. I, I don't know how feasible that is. I'm not a programmer, I'm just throwing it out. Now, there are going to be strategies you can take to sort of like reduce those costs, but those costs are going to be 
you can you, and you can take those strategies, but you, you might not you might not have developed to uh, to take advantage of those. So it might be just simply they're not in a place where they are able to sort of like say, hey, it's not a server capacity problem. It's a volume capacity problem, and we're paying too much, and we don't have enough money or uh, a capital outlay. So it's a very nuanced sort of conversation. I feel for Owl Bear's situation, starting the garage with two people. But, yeah, it's, uh, it's a challenge, and more power to them. Hope it works out. Uh, hope I can provide some insight into what their challenges are, if not without going, well, sorry, without going too deep. Great podcast as always. Look forward to listening to some more. Take care. Bye. And again, again, valid point. This as a labor of love, how much can you invest of your own money? I mean, everything, uh, you know, listen, the VidCast, the podcast, you buy equipment for it. You're doing it because you're enjoying it. And you're having fun. You're not doing it because you're making a profit off this. But you want to have an investment that is is more than good enough, but isn't going to break the bank, right? Because again, it's a hobby for, for Albert Rodeo. It's it's a hobby. They're not in it to make money. It's not roll twenty. It's not fancy grounds. Uh, and a great it's a great product from what I've seen. I got to play with it more. But um, I really do appreciate what they've done. Again, I don't. I'm not a programmer, so I don't. I can say what we'd love to have. I can say, as a GM, I want the ability to keep my campaign and run a campaign on this. Uh, not quite set up for that just yet. Might that change that in the future? Certainly. I don't. I have no inside information, and I'm not a programmer. So I'm not making suggestions, folks. All right. Um. Upcoming stuff uh, tonight, 9 p.m. Eastern on the Ten Cars Tavern Discord server. We do our weekly uh, voice chat hangout. Everybody's welcome. Uh, please, we have it in the Speakeasy voice channel. It's always a good time, from 9 to 11 ish, roughly, Eastern Standard Time. I'll try to take a nap beforehand because I'm an old man. And I get tired easily. Uh, Friday, 8 p.m., should be myself and Joe the Lawyer. Iron Rations, don't know what the topic exactly is going to be yet, but always a good time. Uh, we'll be having dropping guests this time. I don't know. Maybe, perhaps, always fun. Um, other than that, folks, really, thank you. Uh, we've had a great increase in subscribers recently. Uh, our viewership, uh, daily viewership is, is up. Uh, on the podcast side, uh, downloads are up. So it's a win-win across the board. So I thank you all. Wouldn't be able to do this without you. So and again, call the show, 347-509-5168. I listen to everything. I try to put up everything. I'm sure when I was doing the firesides that I must have missed one or two uh, voicemails for that. I apologize. We are in the midst of the world of the pandemic, folks. Use your common sense. Not a medical professional. Me. Not going to tell you what to do other than use your common sense to keep yourself healthy. So if you keep yourself healthy, you can be there for your community, your family, your friends, your loved ones, and keep them healthy. So on that note, be safe. Be well. God bless. Roll those dice. I'm about to sneeze. Oh, my God. And I will talk with you all tomorrow. Knock on wood. I'll be back with uh, Joe the lawyer. All right. Later, folks.